Okay. Hello, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to our audience. So thanks for joining, dear participant. Um, so I'm Monsef Shiwa. I'm uh, with Polytechnic uh, Montreal in Canada. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the second uh, IFAC Industry Connect event for which I will ask, act as a moderator. So first, I'm happy to announce that IFAC Industry Connect has now been approved by the IFAC uh, Technical Board and the IFAC Council. And from now on, it's gonna be a recurrent event uh, around every second month. So some organizational aspect first for today. First, each panelist will present to you his personal view uh, through short statements. And then we will start discussing uh, the specific points uh, related to today's event. Also, as you saw on the slide, uh, all the non-presenters participants will be muted and their camera will be disabled. So to ask a question or to offer your comments, please use the Q&A button. Um, and finally, we will respond to some of your questions during the last part of this seminar. So in today's uh, round table, we're gonna discuss uh, the use of uh, novel machine learning approach to solve control related challenges in various industry sectors. So we'll discuss first to what extent uh, machine learning has been is being used in the industry today. Uh, what are the gaps between machine learning uh, solution and classical approaches for control and monitoring? Also, what type of challenges uh, would be more suitable for machine learning based solution? And finally, last but not the least, uh, how does it take, uh, what does it take to move from a prototypic machine learning solution uh, to a full fledged product? So today's uh, panelists are renowned experts in various industrial sectors, uh, process industry, aerospace, automotive, robotics, biomedical industry. So let me uh, quickly introduce them. Lane Dasboro. So Lane is CEO of Nudge PG, uh, a provider of algorithm and consulting services for diabetes modeling, simulation, and automation. Uh, his notable Accomplishments are uh, the co-creation of Loop Scout and Night Scout. So uh, these are the two largest remote monitoring and diagnosis system in the world for control loop monitoring uh, and people with diabetes respectively. Then we have uh, Professor Biao Yang. So Biao is a professor at the University of Alberta in Canada. Uh, he worked with process industry since 1998 on projects related to process data analytics that include soft sensors, control performance assessment, professor, uh, sorry, process monitoring. Since 2011, uh, he, had, he holds the NSERC Industrial Research Chair in control of all sense uh, where he works on data analytics and machine learning application uh, for uh, this uh, sector of industry or some production. Uh, then we have uh, Alf Isaacson. Uh, so Alf Isaacson has been with ABB Corporate Research since uh, 2001. Uh, he's currently, he currently holds the position um, of uh, Corporate Research Fellow for Automation and Control in Vesteras in Sweden. And uh, recently, since 1st of October, uh, he's also an adjunct professor at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. And finally, uh, we have with us Greg Stewart. So Greg is with Gecko uh, Engineering and the University of uh, British Columbia. Uh, Greg has contributed to the development and productization of machine learning solution for agriculture uh, with Echo Action. Uh, also with Honeywell, he worked on machine learning and control projects for a wide range of industries, paper making, automotive powertrains, and semiconductor manufacturing. So as you can see, we should cover a wide range of uh, industrial application with the, our panelists today. So we'll kindly ask the panelists to first share their opinion. Uh, let's go to Lane, um, Lane's opinion. 
Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Very good. Uh, uh, good day, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, just a very quick introduction. I have had the uh, privilege of participating in many different industries over the past 25 years. Uh, as you can see from this uh, uh, quick summary that my original uh, academic work was in uh, control loop performance monitoring and uh, went into industry uh, after that. Then uh, during a fairly long career at Honeywell, I was uh, deeply involved in uh, uh, remote monitoring of a variety of different aspects of automation, uh, particularly control loops with uh, something called Loop Scout, which was a software as a service, uh, is a software as a service created in 1998 before the term software as a service even existed. Uh, and what we found, uh, at least in that example, was that uh, primitive AI ML techniques like genetic programming and genetic algorithms uh, and supervised learning were uh, incredibly important for scaling uh, and creating a, a situation where the human uh, could be uh, uh, in the loop still, uh, the control engineer uh, monitoring performance, but able to do it at a much larger scale. So uh, uh, AI ML uh, concepts uh, absolutely fueled the capability for Loop Scout to scale to be the largest system in the world. Uh, then spent some time in um, other monitoring decision support uh, for General Electric in the uh, energy sector, uh, combined uh, gas turbine, combined cycle power plants, and uh, transformers, uh, generator step up unit transformers. Uh, then everything changed in my life about 12 years ago when my son was diagnosed with diabetes. Uh, so I've been very focused on. Uh, on that since then. Uh, one thing that seems to be uh, a theme across all of uh, these different domains is uh, the role of the operator, the role of the, the human in these loops, where uh, if, if there's insufficient transparency uh, and trust, the, uh, whether it's a, a pilot or a control room operator or an endocrinologist or a person with diabetes, they'll be asking the same questions. Uh, what is the system doing? Why is it doing that? What's it going to do next? And how did we get into this mode? Uh, and these uh, questions, which are completely valid questions, uh, really come from the sources displayed at the right. Um, uh, opacity, you can't understand what's going on, it's too complex. Uh, and that results in an incorrect mental model, uh, potentially, of what the automation is doing, and you can get in a lot of trouble. So uh, I would really uh, like to just pose a series of uh, questions during this session today, uh, because what I've uh, definitely seen over the last couple of years is if you have enough data, you can, you can definitely make a, a pretty powerful data smoothie uh, just by pressing the buttons of, of the various different AI ML techniques. Uh, so my sense is that if you're going to do this, you need to have an awful lot of data. Uh, you're going to... Um, need to have some very strong measures for how to predict things. Uh, how is it going to scale? Incidentally, that was one of the challenges uh, with Loop Scout. The, the person who developed that technology, uh, the GA, GP, uh, went on to something else and nobody could support what he was doing. Um, I also now work in a very heavily regulated industry with uh, the FDA uh, governing what's going to be approved or not approved. And uh, that brings up a question of how are your how are you going to uh, regulate these, especially in a, in a heavily regulated industry? So uh, with that, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Lane. Uh, let's go now to Bial. She's still with us. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> thank you. I think I then need to stop. Yeah, Le Lane, you have to stop sharing so that Bial can take over. Thank you. Okay. 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 Marcel, can, can you see my slide? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Biao Huang and I'm working with University of Alberta. And uh, over the last uh, 20, about 25 years, you know, I was, um, I had uh, quite a few projects with industries. So I had some experience on in the both research and uh, the industrial applications. So first, I'd like to um, introduce what uh, we did uh, in the machine learning related work. And here's what uh, what happened. So we, we did uh, some uh, work for refinery, for example, like distill distillation column flooding, weeping prediction, and, uh, and flare event predictions. 
and also the chemical compositions predictions, uh, such as soft sensor and the cut point prediction and, and, uh, and also other related uh, predictions of the quality chemical composition variables. And we had uh, a number of applications in oil sense industries, such as the sending detection prediction and the electrical submergible pump monitoring, water content prediction and the bitumen content prediction and so on. And we also developed a predictive monitoring toolbox and with Python as the program uh, framework and also virtual sensor toolbox also in Python. And this is specifically for industry applications. So you can find these uh, toolboxes from the website on my homepage. And we, from this um, interaction with industry and also research um, publications, and we have uh, some thought and from the feedback, the discussions with the practitioners, researchers. So for example, uh, one of the questions that often asked was asked is that the traditional method such as first principles system identification, et cetera, and which we have worked for many, many years. And now we have this uh, model free approach, for example, statistical machine learning. And then they are uh, quite different conceptually, certainly. And then we, for our traditional method, we have explicit models and we can see the models, we can feel it. We can compare it with the fundamental principle, but this model free and uh, how this model free work Certainly, it is getting very popular and very uh, simpler in terms of development. So, but um, you don't know what inside. So, there are a lot of questions around it, even though it's effect, pretty effective. But how we how we use it, how we understand it, and uh, also the traditional statistical method such as PCA, PLS, slow feature, etc. Versus this neural network. So, even for the model for the model free approach. We still have two different types of um, models. So one is the PCA, which is very traditional uh, multivariate statistical method. And then we have current, current nowadays we have this uh, feed for neural network, LAN, CNN, and uh, these again are very different, even though both are the uh, model free. So what difference and how we um, use, uh, use them, how we combine them, and which one has advantage, and uh, so on. Okay, and also uncertainty quantifications. So even for this, uh, this um, model free approach, there are still two different type of uh, applications. So one is the PCA and uh, so that uh, really deterministic from algebraic manipulation, you can get uh, the result. But now we have a lot of stochastic versions such as variation or autoencoder, probability principle component analysis and the PPLS and the pro uh, probabilistic probability slow feature analysis and so on. These are really quantified uncertainty. Again, so which one and uh, it's more um, rigorous in terms of application and all the derivations. Again, there are thought of this debate and now uh, which one can be convenient in, in the actual applications and which one more reliable. And another important question is industrial implementation platform. So most of this uh, machine learning type of work and uh, it normally it could quite quite all of them are, are staying at, at the higher level so not really in the, not many of them or haven't seen uh, many of them with application in the actual dcs that distribute the control systems so implementation is another big challenge what is machine learning and uh, to be materialized in actual autonomous or aut automation and, I, and finally, the practicing engineer and operator acceptance. So for the method, no matter it's control, modeling, and um, soft sensing, or monitoring for detection to be accepted, certainly you need uh, to have these practicing engineers and the operators. They should um, kind of understand what's going on before they can use it or accept it. Or maintain, for example, maintenance is another key point and uh, with something which not uh, something unusual how can it be fixed quickly by operator or engineers 
So the second topic, and again related to today's work, is really machine learning for control. And so the, the earlier slide focusing about modeling and the monitoring our control perspective. And we did the, what we have done in the past include, for example, subspace approach for model predictive to control. It's different from traditional. Basically, we don't have explicit model. So we have subspace um, matrix for control direct design. And also now have reinforced learning for, for fault tolerant control, this is machine learning based. And also reinforced learning based, reinforcement learning based for, um, MPID tuning autonomous tuning and based on reinforcement learning. And also now working on this reinforcement learning for the separation vessel interface control, which basically in the one and the actual industrial application. Again, some thought about um, the machine learning based control. So traditional data driven model free of control and which pretty traditional we have, we, see, we have seen a lot, but now we have neural network based control. Okay, so that again, the two different type of control system. And then we have now have reinforced learning uh, based control for the direct control. So some people propose to use reinforced learning to directly control the process, such as replacing MPC. So is that the worthwhile or is it is the feasible to do that? And then again, this is a debating point. And also reinforced reinforcement learning for the indirect control, such as we rather than using reinforced learning, reinforcement learning to replace MPC or PID. We can use it, this learning as the machine learning as the supervisor, supervisory control, such as PID tuning on MPC tuner or real time optimization. So, for this type of control, and again, we have risk in the practical applications, reinforced learning control, reinforced learning based control, we are well known that it takes time to train the cell. So, how much risk we can take in the process industry? Certainly, it's the question mark to, um, to ask. And uh, of course, there are some solutions suggest based on simulation first. Then we once get the matured from, from simulation learning, then move to the actual tuning and so on. And the industrial implementation framework, always the issue to discuss and where to implement it. And is that can we put it in the DCS or put it in a separate computer and how they communicate with DCS? Finally, the same problem, same question as before, the practicing engineer or operator acceptance for this to, uh, to work. So anyway, so this is what uh, some uh, work we did and uh, some sort of I, I post. Thank you. And I talk back to you. And Thanks a lot, uh, Biao, for this uh, overview and for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we will now uh, listen to uh, Alf. Um... Thank you, Monsef. Let me see if I can share my screen. So you should now be seeing some slides. Yep. So uh, in my previous position before starting as research fellow, I was actually globally responsible for the control research in ABB. So I've seen a number of, of applications of um, machine learning. Uh, in ABB and in ABB corporate research. Actually, we have used this uh, long before we knew that it was actually artificial intelligence that we were doing, right? Uh, but what you see is that many of these applications still are kind of diagnostic or condition monitoring in nature. Uh, only few and more recent are, are trying to be part of a control loop for closing the loop. And what I see is that as we move forward, and uh, I mean, there's lots of talk about autonomy kind of inspired by self-driving cars also uh, for industry. And we need to use um, AI machine learning much more in the context of a closed loop operation. And um, we tried, um, I think it's three years ago, to, um, to give uh, levels of autonomy similar to what you have in, in self-driving cars, also for industry, that you could go from level zero, which by no means 
uh, does not imply that there is, are no control control loops. I mean, you would still have pressure control, level control, uh, temperature control, even though the operator runs the show. And then you go all the way to, to your fully autonomous operation. And I see that there are a number of open questions here and previous um, speakers have touched upon some of them. Uh, I mean, at what level of uh, the the famous automation pyramid, uh, should we, um, or do we think that uh, machine learning AI will have uh, most benefit? Uh, will it, for example, replace PID at the lowest level? Uh, will, I mean, as control engineer, we are used to being able to analyze things like stability. Is it going to be oscillatory? Uh, uh, Etc. That's of course much harder if if there is a machine learning model in in the middle of the closed loop. Uh, is that uh, something that we need to look into? Or I mean, if you look at MPC, for example, we used MPC for many years uh, uh, before people started analyzing stability, and and it worked uh, well. So maybe it's not such a big deal. I don't know. And uh, Bia was uh, touching on both my next two points. So uh, will um, machine learning AI replace traditional system identification or st traditional statistical methods? And what about uh, first principles model, physical modeling? Will that go up or will it go down? We can speculate on that. And, and then uh, I mean, coming back to my previous slide, I mean, how big a role will AI machine learning play when you when you try to move to, to higher levels of autonomy. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Alf. Uh, I think a lot of uh, interesting question. I hope we'll have the time to touch upon during our discussion. Uh, so to close this, I'm gonna ask Greg uh, to present his view and then we can switch to the, to the discussion. All right, thank you very much. I hope you can see this, the slides. Um, uh, so I, I've, as, uh, as Mosef has explained, I've, I've had the opportunity through Honeywell and a couple of other companies to work in a variety of industries. And the, uh, the applications that you see here, that's a, a mix of both uh, control as well as, uh, as machine learning, right? And so the machine learning work, I started the control work back in the, I guess the early 2000s. And then it started to, things like ML started to crop up, I'd say, in the, you know, sometime after 2012. Um, one diagram that um, I think there's a lot of ways that we can look at machine learning and control, but one diagram I find very helpful here is something that looks like this, where you see, um, you, you, this is not my own, right? So it comes from a different place. Data coming in from the left, and those would be the sensors. And then there is the analytics that happens in the blue. And then just, I'll come back to the middle in a second, but it all goes to a decision and then an action. And this action needs to be taken against the world somehow. So if there is no action, then there, you know, there can be no value created. Now, what we tend to find is that um, machine learning, these are pretty vague categories, tends to have, you know, be in this upper, upper level. Control tends to be down below. Like actual PID algorithm will actually move an actuator here, right? Whereas up here at this level, there's a big amount of human input uh, acting on a small amount of, of analysis. And that that's those are quite common as dashboards where, you know, large amount of data is consolidated and shown to people and then they make a decision and an action. So the thing that I found when working with some of these techniques in industrial settings is to really think about the fact that there is a human in the loop and it's not just to approve the, uh, the calculation that you've done, but sometimes they have some information over here, which is not present in your data, whether it's tribal information or, you know, that they've, know how this particular device works and uh, they, they, can, they can bring that in or some of the maintenance information might not even be present in your data. So that decision can be quite uh, helpful. So I've been finding it interesting to sort of learn how to interact with this component, right? And in, in amongst all the other things, right? Now, a um, couple of things to think about this so other than the, the, the human in the loop, the other thing that I find machine learning more a mindset than anything else. They tend to approach the data 
as bound, right? Whereas control engineers will often actively do step tests, right? And so I think both fields have something to learn from one another in a, in a, place, like, uh, in a place like this. All right. Now, a couple of things to think about that, that I've run into with uh, mixing in some way, you know, control and machine learning. Um, first of all, this, you have to augment this diagram up here with the world, right? So you have taken an action on the world, then it might change the data as it comes back. And that crops up in a few ways that I think control engineers can help out a lot, right? So one is you notice that a feedback loop has, uh, has appeared up here, right? And so people often don't take this into account. Like if I take COVID projections, for example, people are often presenting them as an open loop projection when in reality, public health policies close that loop, stabilize it and, and handle it. And it, it makes a big difference for how you have to talk about the projections. Um, I talked a little bit about human in the loop. Uh, sometimes that crops up in super, super simple ways where, for example, uh, you make a great dashboard and if the people in the facility, and this actually happened to me, will say, yep, that looks good, but I, I, I don't have anyone who will look at that screen. Okay, that's something important for you to think about, right? That is a very easy thing to, to miss. And then finally, um, uh, that deploying your solution may actually change the system. And that sounds really obvious, but if I'm doing failure prediction uh, and the original data set that I trained on contains a bunch of equipment failures, I train a model to predict the, you know, the failures, I deploy that. And if I'm now giving warnings and often humans can go out and take an intervention and there are no more failures in the data, right? So you need to think about these things as you're, as you're going to deploy them. And that's something that I think control engineers might do naturally and is something that can be helpful in the machine learning community. And maybe just finally to pick up on a point some of the earlier speakers have mentioned, I tend to look at this not as either or, but if there, there are nice ways that you can combine these techniques, right? And so I think that if you wanna do something completely model free, you're absolutely right. That takes an enormous amount of data, but I don't, have never seen a good motivation for say throwing away structures that come from engineering, like a mass energy balance. I don't need the data to learn this. If a pipe is split, I know what the flows are gonna do. And also you can use these techniques. I find reinforcement learning is a fantastic nonlinear optimizer. Uh, I don't need to implement it online in every case, right? So we've used it for tuning, like one of the other speakers mentioned, PID control, but you can also start to throw in things like, uh, you know, the Andy windup parameter, which is a nonlinearity that you don't normally think about in that framework. So you can deal with a lot of these things in a, in a very kind of exciting way with, with some of these techniques. Okay, anyway, I'll, I'll try to, I've got a lot more to say, but I'll, I'll cut it off there. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Greg. Yeah, I think now uh, we can start um, the discussion among the, the panelists. So uh, I suggest that we start with the first question related to the landscape. It was touched upon during your uh, presentations uh, related to this gap between industry and academia. Uh, more specifically, according to you, to what extent is machine learning uh, used, actually used in industry, in your different industries? So I assume it will vary a lot depending on the industry sector. And what are the gaps between the solutions that are actually implemented using machine learning and the classical uh, implementation, model-based implementation uh, and so forth? So maybe Biao can start, but then you guys can, can uh, present your opinions. You, you don't need me for that. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so um, the industry I'm working with really oil and the chemical industries, and the, the MPC has been quite common. Right? A lot of MPC applications, and of course PID MPC. Now for the machine learning, and then particularly this reinforced learning and AI, I think right now most of them still an IT level, so really the in a higher level. So the people who work uh, who are in control of this um, machine learning perhaps many of them are the it computer and computer engineer computer scientists and then for the control systems control engi engineering layer and a lot of interest but uh, the question is that uh, how this can be implemented and uh, we i should say and uh, some implementation already happened such as the soft sensor so the control problem, we normally have feedback, and so we, we basically interfere 
or it doesn't interfere with control, send the signal back to the process. Or alternatively, human being and uh, participate in a final action. So that self-sensing monitoring, these type of the applications need a human being interference. So when the alarm issued, all self-sensing send a signal, say, and uh, need to whatever composition at this level, so what action to take. So human being can interfere, can basically can, can take action and can make a decision to do it or not to do it. And direct, uh, uh, and another one is tuner. tuner. So we're doing this um, reinforce, reinforcement learning for the PID tuning and PC tuning. Again, so this is not direct control. So you get the tuning like decision support. So reinforce, reinforcement learning or machine learning can give you some tuning parameters and the expert like a, like tuner like an expert expert tune, tune, tuner and uh, then as human being you can decide what to do but to direct control and uh, control like replacing MPC I think that uh, still bit of um, some distance before it can actually put the into the direct control control valve how to uh, manipulate the process Anyway, so this is what uh, my quick thought, and uh, certainly, and uh, well, interested in listening to other expert uh, opinion. Thank you. Um, I'd be happy to add a little perspective uh, from a regulated industry viewpoint. Um, uh, first of all, uh, I can think of three regulated industries: uh, commercial aviation and. Um, uh, um, uh, highway driving and uh, medical devices. The uh, FDA uh, is very interested. They know that uh, AIML is coming. Uh, as recently as last week, they had a uh, panel discussion, uh, pan industry, academia, and uh, consumers, uh, raising some uh, flags and concerns and opportunities. What we're seeing mostly is the loop that uh, uh, my uh, esteemed uh, fellow panelists have already discussed about there's a human in the loop. There's a radiologist looking at the uh, interpretation that some machine has made. Um, uh, another example would be the uh, news last week of uh, the appointment or the recommendation of appointing Missy Cummings to uh, be on a panel for the NHTSA, uh, which has raised the ire of, of uh, Elon Musk at uh, Tesla, uh, uh, but I'm uh, actually very glad to see that the regulators are attempting to take a, a fairly um, uh, important stance on or, or aggressive stance on, on this topic. And then uh, the tragic example of the NCAS with the 737 MAX, although it's not AIML, I think it raises some of the same concerns around uh, transparency uh, and uh, what happens if the human uh, is in the loop and, and not on the same page as the automation. Um, maybe just one comment on that. I'd like to wonder, there's um, a kind of a host of processes out there where are, are well controlled today by either PID or MPC. Um, and one thing after, you know, I worked for quite a few years trying to get MPC to replace PID. And there are cases where those things are just fine where they are at the low level. So um, I don't see any reason to swap them out and plop in something else. They have great transparency. Every, everyone who works with PID knows how to tweak it if they need to, and that gives them a lot of comfort, right? So if they don't understand what your black box is, you could just get shut off and they'll go back to doing whatever they were they were doing. So, so I, I wouldn't necessarily look at ML to kind of swap those things out, but rather, you know, which automation problems do PID and MPC struggle on? And, and you know, is it due to a different kind of sensor, which you might not think of as a sensor in control engineering or you know that just the problem itself is much more complicated. So potentially there, there's a you know a, an opening for them. But I, I personally would I wouldn't think that we have anything to gain by swapping out the you know what's working well. On the other hand, we could find ways to tune them, like like I was just mentioned. And I think Alf wanted to add something. I see your hand. Oh yes, <laughs> thank you, Monson. Uh, I mean, when I made the shift 20 years ago from academia into industry, I felt that it was rather smooth and and uh, that, I mean, I found that we work on very much the same problems. And uh, I've often used the, the quote uh, that um, the gap between theory and practice is bigger in theory than in practice. Uh, 
And but this time, I actually think that the, we are lagging a bit, right? Uh, for obvious reasons, there is actually quite a lot out there in the academic community for AI machine learning that we are yet to apply in, in industry. It is, of course, not uh, uniform. Uh, if you look at mobile robotics, uh, there are, I mean, already uh, vision solutions with AI being applied, et cetera. But if you look at process industry that we talked about, I mean, face it, uh, we struggle to get our customers to use uh, systematic tuning methods for their PID controllers at all. Uh, so now we're talking whether we should replace what we we haven't really been able to uh, convince everybody with reinforcement learning instead. So I think there is a, there is a considerable gap there, right? And I I really think that we need to kind of separate. I I usually talk about open control systems versus embedded control systems. And, and I mean, a distributed control system for a process industry, that's an open control system. The, the, the user can tamper, can play with the PID parameters, right? Whereas if you take your smartphone, there's lots of control loops in a smartphone, but you cannot uh, change the PID parameters or whatever control uh, method is used in there. Nor will you probably be able to change that vision system in, in your robot, right? And of course, we can do a bit more advanced things if we embed the stuff and we don't, don't touch it later. It's the expert. You can, you can spend a lot of expert knowledge on something where you sell 10,000 or 50,000 robots in a year. But if it's a one-off project with MPC in, in one paper mill, the engineering effort quite often becomes uh, prohibitive if you want to do something advanced, right? It's not the technology that is the bottleneck, it's the amount of experts you have to fly in from another country to be able to do this that, that sets the limit, right? And I think we are, we are there. I mean, many in process industry, many AI machine learning applications are still what I would call aspirational. We, we can do it in, in the lab, but will have we rolled it out en masse? Not really yet, but it's ramping up quite quickly. So if we come back in, in a year or two, uh, the situation might be drastically different. Let's hope for that. Thank you, Alf. Uh, I, I had a question on the applicability, what type, but I think you partially answer to what type of application are most suitable for machine learning. So because of um, time is running, I'm going to skip directly to my third question. I think the audience will be interested in your experience in productization. So um, for you, what does it take? Uh, to move from a prototypic ML solution to a full-fledged product. Uh, what are the important issues that has to be dealt with when you move from research to production? And like one panelist told me, uh, what about the ITs, the scalability, the maintainability, the usability, the safety? How does it influence the productization of such solution? Uh, don't know, Lane, maybe you can start with that. Uh, well, at least in my world, 100% uh, completely uh, affects things. If you don't have enough data, uh, whether it's actually uh, real world data, real world real world data, or uh, uh, say simulation uh, derived data uh, for evidence generation, I think it's going to be very difficult to uh, adequately characterize the behaviors of these systems, uh, particularly in in very widely scaled uh, uh, yet. Uh, individually, um, uh, individualized uh, uh, systems like chronic disease management. So an insulin pump is an embedded device. Uh, it does have control algorithms in it, but uh, the gain of the human varies by two orders of magnitude. Uh, a small baby's insulin needs uh, uh, are, are a fraction of uh, 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 an adult with type 2 diabetes. So I think this is going to be very challenging for the regulators, uh, the, the amount of evidence required. 
And uh, because, uh, especially in chronic disease management, uh, you're living in a very wide range of users and use conditions, how do you adequately characterize the universe of all human activities and physiology? Uh, because the regulators are, they just don't want to get in trouble for approving a device that later uh, causes some, some failure, some, some tragic event. Great. Uh, thank you, Lane. Greg, maybe? Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting, actually. I find um, in both ML and in control, uh, there's things that you need to do in order to get them to production. And the thing that I found, at least in the areas that I've worked in, which is agriculture, process industries, and, and automotive, um, we really have to get the algorithm right. It's got to it's got to deliver what you what you want it to do. Um, but then the interaction with the the humans tends to be, and the user tends to be, the thing that ends up being very responsible for whether you know we get it to production or not. Right. And so the the user has got to find it better than he or she did prior to you coming along, right? So otherwise I'd be happy to go back to whatever they were doing before. So it's got to deliver them value and it's got to not disrupt their lives and it's got to, you know, maintain, you know, it's got, it's got to be something that they can understand, right? Now, one thing I found is that uh, control engineering, we talk a lot about, oh, we, you know, we can prove stability. And usually that means that we've also brought along with us some information about the plant, right? You know, in some way, either it's an assumption or experience we know that it's linear or we know that it's nonlinear, but you know, it's this kind of nonlinearity. And that allows us to do these you know, stability analyses. Whereas in machine learning, if you, if you don't have that, then you need a whole lot more data to cover every circumstance and then to prove that you've covered every circumstance and that your, your, your system did behave itself in that way. So I think the, the, the data and the, the value of it that you're doing and, and also the usability and, and how the users either accept or reject it are things that I found are, are very important if you want something to make it over into production. Thank you, Greg. Um, Biao, please go ahead. Yeah, so um, what uh, I think the, to, to make uh, machine learning implemented in the process industry, the two things that for sure are to be, to be considered. One is safety and that must be safe. The second one is transparency. So the, without knowing what's going on, and uh, it's very really difficult to convince the engineer to use it. Um, so just like uh, <laughs> driving a vehicle, you need to know the, the, the car. <laughs> but I don't need to know so much detail, but at least you know the, the car, how to move, and so on. So that's very important to two, two aspect. Now that, so for the for same reason, and uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, and machine learning has been utilized in the, in the in the soft sensing and the monitoring, so that uh, application. I know some audience ask about uh, uh, this application PID. I don't I don't I don't think uh, machine learning has been directly replaced PID or MPC, but uh, machine learning for PID tuning, for MPC tuning and that will coming. I believe is coming because the under very difficult situations when human being cannot get the good tuning tuning parameters. Then this reinforced learning or machine learning can indeed provide a good uh, guideline. Okay, so that's it to my, my two cents. Thank you, Biao. Oh. Uh, Alpha, I don't know if the. Uh, yeah, you raised my hand again. It's in, your, it's in your hand. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it takes really a whole ecosystem of data management and the bookkeeping of. of uh, your data and contextualization of, uh, of your data. Uh, so to productize ML is not just build one model on one bucket of data. It, it's something that uh, where you can maintain these models uh, during a lifetime of this installation. And of course it's, it's used uh, very much already more in a, in a in an advisory uh, uh, capacity, right? Uh, when I said it's aspirational earlier, I mean when when you really try to close the loop. But of course, uh, processing data and and showing that in a dashboard to to a user that that is done and has been done uh, without. Uh, I mean. 
neural networks or AI, but but uh, it, it really uh, data labeling is is a real bottleneck uh, if you want to do supervised learning, and you really need to be very systematic there. Okay, thank you, Alf. Uh, sorry, Sebastian, I know you raised your hand, but I would like to pick. Uh, maybe you can answer to it one at least one question from the audience, unless it will be very frustrating. Although some of you already answered partly because you had a look at the question. I would like to pick on one question related to uh, the expectation. So um, the participant is saying there is a lot of expectation in the industry that machine learning AI can solve most of the problems. Perhaps this expectation is built on hearing and seeing what is happening in the tech world, which is a very different industry than for example, process industry. What can academia industry do to ground expectation in reality for data scientists working in process industries. So who would like to come? I'm not sure if Bia wanted to comment or? Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm working in both the research and industry. Certainly yes. in a research perspective, I know and a lot, a lot of publications, machine learning, a huge, huge amount of publications. And um, certainly to bring, bring them to application, there's still a lot of gaps. And uh, I, I still believe um, to have application in process industry, chemical industry, understanding of the process, the fundamental knowledge, I still think it's important. So machine learning, and you can do machine learning without any prior process information knowledge. Or you do machine learning with some hybrid approach, or you just purely based on the first principle approach. So I still think the middle one is the best one. So you, 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 you start from understanding the process, you try your best to use whatever knowledge you have. If you can derive a physical equation, use all them. Use them, they are going to work out. But uh, of course, many of, many of them have some unknown parameters, some block which is not known. So if you cannot derive the first principle model, then you can try to use machine learning to replace it, so to make it work. So I, again, so to summarize, I still think combination of the first principle and the data will work better in the applications. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Biao. I think we got the message. I think Lane wanted to quickly comment. Yeah, on I will that. make just a, a very quick comment. Uh, this, uh, and I don't want to end on a negative note, but uh, some of us are old enough to remember uh, the first time AI came around, and there was a great hype cycle and almost a solution looking for a problem where it was perceived as the uh, sexy new thing. And how come you uh, Luddite control engineers aren't embracing this? And uh, I've seen this uh, academic department's rebranding as uh, process control and AIML uh, conferences that uh, now uh, expect speakers to talk about AIML, even if the subject isn't AIML. Uh, companies like my prior company, Medtronic, buying AIML companies uh, for uh, essentially unnecessary reasons where a, a stochastic model would have been uh, just fine. So uh, not to end on a negative note, just to say, uh, there, I think there is some hype to this and we should be cautious about how we apply these. Thank you, Lane. And last, last comment from Arsh then. Well, I mean, I look at it as a, as a step response with overshoot. <laughs> uh, it will for sure settle down uh, but it will settle at a much higher level than when we started, right? But uh, of course there is some hype, but it will, we will see a lot of uh, applications of AI and ML in, in a few years to come. I'm, I'm quite convinced of that. Okay, Thank, thanks a lot. Thank you both for this uh, closing uh, words of uh, caution and optimism at the same time. <laughs> So with that, I would like to uh, close this um, session of IFAC Industry Connect webinar. Uh, thank you to all our panelists for the valuable uh, input. Thank you all of you uh, for attending to this event. Uh, invitation will be sent soon uh, for the next webinar, uh, probably uh, that we plan to have in around two months. I would like to tell also the audience that uh, we are always looking for uh, panelists and also for uh, topics you think are of interest for both academia and industry. So please, if you have an idea on the topic, if you want to join as a panelist, contact me directly. I'd be happy to organize that with you. So again, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of you. 
for this uh, nice webinar and hope to see uh, some of you at least in around two months. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you.